Can you see this? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Okay, I can start my second lecture uh, about the uh, uh, anatomy uh, for skull base surgery. The skull base surgery is not only for tumor surgeon, uh, but also cerebrovascular surgeon. Uh, especially uh, anti-prinoidectomy is necessary to correct, to manipulate the paraprinoid aneurysm. And uh, the anticrinoidectomy is the entering gate to a skull base surgeon. Uh, because uh, the just lateral to anticrinoid process, there is a cavernous sinus and uh, elevating dura propria from cavernous sinus uh, is uh, uh, connecting to a cavernous dissection expo exposing uh, the, the cranial nerves. And uh, it is connecting to a middle force of dissection, especially for anterpetrosectomy. Uh, the Kawase triangle or Gasco triangle is very important in uh, anthropetrosectomy, but uh, to, uh, to understand uh, this anatomy, uh, it is very important to get the hemostasis by uh, after elevating the dura propria or uh, dura from the middle fossa. The very important landmark is the temporal rhomboid consisted by VC posterior border. GSPN, arcade eminence, and petrous edge. And uh, in uh, uh, just uh, under the GSPN, there's a C6 carotid uh, in, a, in the bone, and uh, uh, just posterior to a C6, C7 junction, there is a cochlea. And uh, uh, you can scrutinize the internal auditory canal uh, along the uh, uh, petrous edge. And uh, uh, just uh, just the proximal, uh, just a posterior to a GSPN, there is the genicular gland. They are a very important random now. And we can get the operative field in between uh, trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve uh, in anterior petrosectomy. This is important. And uh, in uh, uh, posterior petrosectomy, we have to do a mastoidectomy. Uh, we can get the operative field uh, in, uh, uh, between the facial nerve and the uh, ninth nerve. And if we go to a uh, uh, posterior fossa uh, with a uh, lateral suboccipital craniotomy or far, la far lateral craniotomy, uh, Sometimes we need the uh, condylar anatomy, condylar fossa anatomy, uh, to to perform the uh, transcondylar fossa uh, approach. Condylar fossa is a very important uh, place to 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 perform the uh, transcondylar approach. Uh, here, there is a posterior condylar emissary vein and the canal, and. Uh, uh, in the uh, occipital condyle, there is a hypochlorous canal. So to understand the condylar fossa anatomy uh, it is uh, very important to approach to a posterior fossa. Uh, I'll show you anticrinal uh, process anatomy. This is a picture from uh, uh, process, Professor Fukushima's uh, skull-based textbook. Uh, after anticrinoidectomy and the cavernous dissection, the you can expose uh, the cranial nerves 2, 3, 4, B1, B2, B3, like this. And uh, there are many triangles, uh, anteromedial triangle, uh, anterolateral triangle, uh, lateral loop for lateral triangle, last of uh, Kawase uh, Parkinson triangle between uh, B1 and uh, trochlea. Uh, these are very important uh, triangles and uh, anatomy that we should understand. When we perform the uh, uh, front temporal craniotomy for anticrinoidectomy, I, I usually perform a skin incision like this uh, along the uh, parietal branch and the ST trunk, uh, including uh, those two branches in the skin flap, and elevate the skin flap and uh, uh, detach the temporal muscle from the bone, from a linear temporalis, and uh, the reflected the inferiorly and make the, uh, the front temporal craniotomy like this. Uh, 
this is a fully operative CT scan uh, with the 3D uh, reconstruction. Now you can see the, the right side anticlinal of the process, the sphenoid ridge, uh, and the right here is a sphenoid ridge connecting to a lateral edge of anticlinal process, apex of anticlinal process. And the, here, the medial edge of anticlinal process. You can see here is the opticonal. Now the supraclinoid, the para, para, uh, paraclinoid ophthalmic segment aneurysm is uh, protruding uh, superimediary in this case, just under the optic nerve. Uh, with this uh, image, we can understand medial edge of anticlinal process uh, shows the distal drawing. The lateral edge of anticlinal process shows the proximal ring. Here is the apex. Apex of anticlinal process always locate in just the medial corner of the carotid cycle. Okay? This is a very important. This is the actual uh, dissection of the right side front temporal craniotomy and the partial cavernous dissection to expose the anticlinal process lateral edge. Here is the apex, here is the optic canal. Uh, you can see here the third nerve, V1 and the V2, anterolateral triangle between V1 and the V2, prominent vacuum is right here. Here is a far lateral triangle between V2 and the V3. V3 is still covered by dura. So uh, these, uh, the cavernous triangles are very important. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the process of anticlinal dectomy. Uh, after uh, exposing anticlinal process, you can begin the during inside anticlinal process from lateral to, to medial by uh, skeletonizing the optic canal. You can see the optic canal must be preserved with the egg shell bone not to expose directly the optic sheath. And the inside anticlinal process must be drilled away, making a hollow. After taking out the anticlinal process, the optic sheath can be incised and expose the optic nerve and the decompressed optic nerve. And you can see here, here the C6 carotid. There, the there was an anticlinal process, apex was here, and the medial edge of, of anticlinal process was here. So, medial process of anticlinal process attaching to a distal drawing, lateral edge of anticlinal process attached to a proximal ring. You can see. Uh, I, I'll show you an example of the anticlinal dectomy. Uh, this is a right side uh, ophthalmic aneurysm. Uh, after front temporal craniotomy, you can skeletonize the uh, remaining sphenoid ridge. Like this, the, you can skeletonize all of it and uh, uh, expose the meaning of the band and the super the feature. I am inciting a dura proprie on a super the feature, carefully with the highest magnification and uh, uh, careful hemostasis. And uh, that is a V1, uh, the inner lecticular layer of a cavernous cal sinus uh, can be detached with the dura propria and the uh, uh, meaning of the band can be incised and uh, the lateral edge of anticlinal process and the superior wall of anticlinal process can be exposed. After exposing anticlinal process lateral edge, uh, you can draw the uh, anticlinal process inside skeletonizing optic now. And then the remaining apex of anticlinal process can be detached 
carefully, you can see here is the, the third knot, optomotor knot, right here. Here is the top marine. So here is the farm and rotundum V2 segment, and uh, this is an incision to uh, this dura ring. The inferior part of this dura ring can be inside and partially open the, the cavernous sinus. Uh, it can be get the hemostasis. Then, uh, optic keys can be opened. <laughs> Next, uh, you can confirm the uh, ophthalmic artery. Here, you can see this is the ophthalmic artery just below optic nerve. It is coming uh, into the optic canal under the optic nerve. Next, uh, you can you can expose the distal dura in the part. Here is the ophthalmic battery. Be careful not to in injure it. You can see here. This is the superior part of distal dura. And the medial part of the distal dura can be inside. At this moment, the I am confirming the aneurysm. This is an unexpected small aneurysm at the ophthalmic origin. Uh, we couldn't see it on the uh, CT angle. Uh, this is the main part of the large aneurysm. And uh, here is the remaining part of the distal dual ring attaching to a uh, uh, lateral wall of the uh, parotid. Here, at this moment, you can understand that uh, here is the distal ring, here is the proximal ring, here is the inferior part of the distal ring. But this is a surgical cell, uh, partially open the cavernous sinus, and uh, you can see this is the diaphragma uh, cell just under the, uh, the stratinal parotid. Now, the C3 carotid has already been opened by uh, opening the uh, carotid from the membrane, and then put the temperature on the C3 carotid to reduce the tension of the aneurysm, and uh, put the clip on the both aneurysm, preserving ophthalmic carotid. Like this. The, du the, as I showed you, during uh, the dissection of anticlinal process, partially uh, we can uh, dissect the uh, lateral trans lateral cavernous wall. After elevating dura propria from a super optical tissue posteriorly, so here is the lateral edge of antitinous process apex right here. At first, uh, you can uh, uh, confirm the ocular motor cavernous segment right here, and be just, just below the uh, antitinous process. And the post map should be here, and the V1 and the V2. Uh, V1 inferior border is the uh, inferior, uh, inferior boundary of the uh, a super optical fissure, and uh, uh, here is the front and bottom. Just a moment.
Sorry, sorry. Uh, battery is uh, battery is getting empty. So sorry, sorry. Okay, now I can continue. Uh, and uh, the, so the, with the, the elevation of a dura propria, uh, you can confirm the uh, these anatomy like this. So this is a uh, the illustration by my colleague Cosmo Noda uh, uh, of the uh, uh, so, uh, Beijer SC aneurysm and MC aneurysm. Uh, I'll show you an uh, actual example of a uh, right side uh, Beijer SC aneurysm. This looks a bit better, but this is the SC aneurysm. Uh, after opening the door, at first we try to do a distal transriven approach at the uh, uh, anterior temporal approach. Opening a distal cerebral fissure, exposing an M2 segment. This is the MC bifurcation. And uh, this is the temporal impulse is retracted by a sucker. And uh, the C1 segment of carotid and here is on peripheral artery which is attaching to a temporal impus, and this is the origin of PFON, the temporal edge, and the ultramotor nerve system segment coming into ultramotor foramen. And uh, this is uh, the adherent uh, vein and the anterior artery at the temporal impus by incising the arachnoid uh, above the uh, PQ segment, uh, you can expose the uh, P com and the P1 P2 segment. And uh, now the temporal impus could be retracted posteriorly to widen the uh, retrocarotid space. Medial to ultramotor, uh, inferior to a carotid, you can uh, uh, confirm the uh, uh, aneurysm and the visual bifurcation. That is the contralateral of P1, the tiny ipsilateral P1. And uh, I am confirming the origin of a structure P1. Small structure P1 has a tiny important perforator, uh, like the uh, perforator coming into a midbrain. And the visual comes in the depths. Uh, it can be accessed lateral through the lateral to ultramotor nerve. At this moment, I decided to mobilize the ultramotor motor nerve, uh, the epidural anterior temporal approach is necessary to, to release the ultramotor foramen and the cavernous segment of the ultramotor nerve. Now, the cavernous segment of the motor and the ultramotor foramen completely open and uh, uh, mobilize the ultramotor nerve. Then uh, you can put the temperature on the beta and the contralateral of P1 and the reduced tension of the visual uh, uh, SC aneurysm and uh, confirm the, all the perforators. You can see. And I am confirming the, the small tiny perforator is a uh, uh, bit by uh, tip of uh, the brain. So I am a bit adjusting the tip of the quick brain not to bite the important tiny properly. Now the that one, yeah, this one. This one was a hit. Yeah, it's a first hit, but it could be preserved. So, important thing the blood vessel pressure here, no red cell, and the highest bright, highest manifestation and the bright operative field enables you to confirm all the important anatomy. Even after the transcavernous approach, 
with complete hemostasis, makes the operative field clean, and uh, it can perform the complete neck clipping regarding all perforating important one. And uh, this is a, a closure of a cavernous sinus and the dura. I am closing the automotive lamen, this lip, and the CT angel, and the diffusion image shows a no high signal patient uh, recovered well. Another case, this is a 55 year old female, uh, Beijing Aika aneurysm, right side Beijing Aika. Uh, Aika uh, uh, usually arises from a mid Beijing, so uh, it is uh, difficult to approach to Aika. But, uh, the, in this case, the Aika aneurysm is uh, uh, located in high position because of arthroscope change. This is a cavernous dissection. The anterolateral triangle between V1 and V2 is exposed. And uh, this is the ultramotor nerve. And the ultramotor foramen is still uh, preserved. And uh, the, here is the first nerve that is exposed. Uh, Dedicus membrane, lateral to ultramotor, uh, media to uh, fourth nerve is uh, open, and uh, P2 and the SCA is exposed. Now, the ultramotor, uh, the dura between the ultramotor and the fourth nerve is uh, uh, inside, and the partially terminal sinus is open. Get the hemostasis with the five minutes of the gel form. And the ultramotor foramen is opened. To secure the proximal vagina, proximal to a kind of like this. Dissection between the third nerve and the fourth nerve is a, a uh, key to secure the proximal value in a transcaphenous approach like this. So, uh, even an uh, eye aneurysm can be uh, clipped through the uh, uh, transcaphenous route with a transcaphenous approach. Now, we can go to a middle post anatomy. As I told you, in the anteropetrosectomy, we can secure the operative field between uh, trigeminal foramen and uh, internal auditory canal. This is an uh, anatomy after elevation of the uh, dura uh, from a B to B3 and exposing GSP. Here is the P plus H. Uh, this is a, a skeleton of the supersensitive canal which indicates arcade eminence. Uh, the definition of a glass cox triangle is the posterior point of a foramen ovale, crossing point of the GSPN and the VC posterior border, and uh, uh, genital, uh, 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 C6, 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 C7 junction. This is a glass cox triangle. Uh, in, on the other hand, Kawasaki triangle is a defined crossing point the GSPN and um, this of the border and uh, posterior point of post trigeminus and uh, or C6, C7 junction. This is a Kawasaki triangle. B2, B3, ovary, rotundum, middle meningeal artery, at the from and spinosum. Arcade eminence super semicircular canal, B plus H. And uh, between uh, arcade eminence and the GSPN, uh, it, this angle can be divided in each 60 degree. And uh, in this direction, uh, IAC is running. So again, this is a glass cock triangle and uh, Kawasaki triangle.
after skeletonizing the temple rhomboid, you can expose, uh, you can skeletonize the internal auditory canal. Inside there is a facial nerve, cochlea, and uh, vestibular nerves. And uh, uh, lateral to, uh, uh, anterolaterally to uh, IAC, uh, there is a cochlea, and the facial nerve is running just above cochlea posteriorly uh, toward the uh, genitrate ganglion, and it divides, it divides GSPN as a parasympathetic fiber, and turn posteriorly facial nerve itself, turn posteriorly with the uh, nerves inter intermediates to the uh, fallopian canal as uh, a tympanic segment. And the vestibular nerve is uh, running towards the vestibule uh, between uh, vestibular nerve and uh, facial nerve. Here is a, there is a, a build bar. This is an important anatomy. So in anterpetrosectomy, as I told you, we can secure the opiate field between trigeminal and seven and eight complex around the inner petrosa. The temporal rhomboid, after temporal rhomboidectomy, uh, the, this uh, bluish, uh, blue line space uh, is a main corridor in uh, anterpetrosectomy. Anter uh, I'll show you an actual case of a 31 year old female oh. dumbbell shaped uh, naked cape meningioma. This is the right side deep frontotemporal craniotomy. After the craniotomy, the skeletonization of the uh, uh, phenol ridge, and uh, I am exposing the uh, in involved the band and uh, inside in the split of the tissue. Here is the foramen rotunda. The dura propria on the foramen rotunda is inside. The anterolateral triangle has a beta hemostasis with a surgical cell. And uh, that breeding point is the from spinosum of uh, uh, middle main that is coming. And uh, this is the flattening of a middle fossa. And uh, after cutting the middle main artery, I am uh, 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 it's exposing uh, the remaining middle main artery in from uh, spinosum and the coagulated with the parking surgery. And I am confirming the GSPN with a nerve stimulator, the patient reaction. And this is an incision on the foramen over. And I am trying to expose the GSPN. And this is a gastrin ganglion with a tumor bulging. Uh, here is the GSPM. Here, here should be genitalic ganglia. And uh, Dura is elevating from the uh, uh, temporal rhomboid. So here is the posterior border of B3. Here is uh, the beginning of a metric case. And uh, here is the posterior point of trigeminal foramen. Uh, I am getting a hemostasis after elevating uh, the temporal dura. So here is the metric case. Now you can see here. This is the temporal rhomboid. This is the posterior border from an ovary, petrous edge. Arcade terminus GST and the front and rotundum over a DPV2.
And uh, if you do the sample wrong boy, anterior medial corner is the uh, uh, safest point to begin to draw because there is a cystic target just below GSPN. So be careful. Uh, crossing to GSPN, uh, there is a risk of injury of a cystic target, not to draw the cystic target. And uh, here is the uh, IAC. Here is the IAC. Uh, here is the arcade terminus. Arcade terminus. Here should be cochlear. The IAC is uh, uh, skeletonized. After skeletonization of the uh, uh, super semicircular IAC in the cochlea, uh, you can you can inside uh, the connective tissue on the gas and ganglion preserving the pyogenial nerves. There is a tumor in a medical cave. The tumor can be taken out from the medical cave. The, in this case, uh, the origin of the tumor uh, should be from the uh, case. So uh, this is the origin. Uh, the tumor in the maker case can be taken out. And by uh, opening the post trigeminus, uh, here is the uh, opening of a uh, posterior border of post trigeminus in the pit in a pitrosa. The uh, trigeminal nerve root could be confirmed. The, the tumor uh, anterior to uh, uh, trigeminal castellian ganglia, uh, you can see it, and the, the tumor in the medical case could be taken out. And uh, I'm opening uh, the portal fossa, that is a feature nerve and eight nerve. And uh, this is a uh, anterior, anterior part of a tumor uh, extending to a portal fossa. The tumor was attached to a fixed nerve just coming into a Doral's canal. Uh, this is all that the field anterior to uh, trigeminal nerve. Uh, you can see the V1, V2 nerve fiber uh, still preserved. This is a final view after the removal of the tumor. This is a patient nurse. So this is a, 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 a medical case. And uh, here is a, the six nerve, the road tunnel entry. Now, uh, after confirming complete hemostasis, I am stitching the dura to close it. Like this. Then uh, you can put the uh, like this. MRS can show after the total removal. So next, uh, we can go to a master technique. Master technique is important for post petrol technique. After master triangle, root of the eye sign of Henry, master tip, ask it here. This is the most important triangle uh, to, to perform the master technique. After, uh, this is a picture from the Professor Fukushima discovery picture. After the muscle me, you can skeletonize temporal tegument, single sinus, sinus, dual angle, SPS, 
lateral forces super semicircular canal broken canal in calcium and uh, this is a very important anatomy. If you perform a muscle with me with a C-shaped incision uh, surrounding muscle body like this, the elevated skin flap, the elevated muscle, stem cut muscle anteriorly, occipital muscle superiorly, spring is kept to posterior. Then you can expose the muscle body. And the usual confirm the asterion, the spinal handy, posterior border of uh, muscle, muscle tip. Then you can scratch the muscle. The simon sign is not to injure it. Fish, fish, uh, uh, egg, egg shell technique is necessary. And open the muscle dantum, confirm incas inside. And uh, you can find the yellow compact bone as the lateral semicircular canal. And in the same depth, there is a parkin canal. And uh, gradually you can scratch the fully single module and the lymphatic that temporize pigment uh, for the canal called the tympan. Uh, by muscle definitely we can go to a fossil face section. Especially the removal of petra sage uh, lateral to a super semicircular canal. This is uh, important to do a fossil petro section. After muscle definitely still remaining bone. Uh, like this, uh, this one should be drilled away, then uh, skeletonize a uh, pre single SPS temporal tagging, fully skeletonize uh, the semicircular canals, like this. Uh, with this, uh, that this is a maximized, maximized postal petrosecond. And uh, this is an important landmark of a postal petrosecond. Uh, after the, the, during the, uh, the, Semicircular canals, you can do uh, the labyrinth technique and uh, uh, export the IST. This is as well uh, a picture from uh, Professor Fukushima's uh, textbook. This is as well. The time is limited, so uh, uh, we can go to uh, uh, I think it's almost time, so I should finish. So, uh, in summary of uh, anterior and the middle skull base anatomy, anterior process and the cavernous lateral wall anatomy. This is uh, very important to come into a skull base anatomy. Uh, Cavernous sinus anatomy with relating triangles, many triangles. Uh, each name of uh, each triangle uh, does not matter, but uh, we have to understand the uh, relationship of the triangle and the cranial nerves and other structures. Uh, in the middle fossa, the temporal rhomboid. GSPN, BC posterior border, Petra CH, arcade eminence. Uh, this landmark of anatomy is important to understand the temporal rhomboid. And uh, foramen rotundum ovale, spinosum, arcade eminence, GSPN, Petra CH, ISP. Uh, you should understand this anatomy. And when uh, we uh, we, uh, we perform the mastoid, mastoid process anatomy, outer mastoid triangle, sinodural angle, digastric ridge, mastoid dantrum, lateral super process semicircular canals. And uh, I couldn't show you this time uh, the chondral fossa, uh, but uh, uh, we have to understand the surgical definition of chondral fossa. Where is the chondral fossa? Uh, it is located between the uh, 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 occipital chondral and the uh, hip of sigmoid sinus. Uh, I can show you uh, this anatomy in another opportunity.
in a postgres call base ah i couldn't show you this one so uh, uh, i skipped this anyway uh we uh, there is uh, so many anatomies we should we should run so uh, the 40 minutes talking is uh, uh, impossible to to explain everything uh, in detail so i'll finish uh this time second lecture thank you very much well, thanks to you dr tanikawa for such a remarkable lecture um on behalf of cn i'd like to thank you again okay so we have thank you we have a few questions from the audience the first mm -hmm. one is uh what management do you offer before temporal clippling for example do you increase blood pressure before doing a temporal clipping uh temporary clipping i i always ask the anesthesiologist to elevate the blood pressure the before temporary occlusion uh our anesthesiologist controls the blood pressure with uh, uh, normal to a uh, uh, bit hypertension, around 100 millimetri in systolic pressure. But uh, when uh, we try to do a temporary occlusion of a parent artery, like a carotid, a basal artery, something, uh, I always ask them to elevate the blood pressure in systolic 150 millimetri during temporary operation to to make the collateral strong okay sir okay. do you use thank you do you use any kind of anticoagulant medication during a bypass surgery uh only aspirin only aspirin before surgery okay. uh, during surgery i use the heparin locally uh, after after harvesting STA or uh, big graft, uh, irrigate inside, uh, inside, inside of a uh, graft. And uh, after temporal occlusion of parent artery and uh, after opening up the artery with arteriotomy, irrigate inside with uh, a heparin and saline. That's it. No systemic administration of heparin. Okay. Um, what percentage of patients present with visual disturbances after a clinoidectomy? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, in our institute, uh, the total visual disturbance, uh, including a blindness and a partial uh, uh, field, visual field defect, is uh, 9%. And uh, the blindness in 6% in our know, cities. So, relatively, uh, th this is a high incidence of uh, visual disturbance. It's, it cannot be ignored. And uh, we have uh, several uh, discussion of, about the, uh, the uh, blindness after antiprimal death. Uh, we have published it on uh, general neurosurgery and world, world neurosurgery. Okay, sir. How do you prevent or deal with a CSF leak when performing an anterior temporal, pretemporal approach? Uh, you mean the, the anterior, epidural anterior temporal approach? Uh, in that approach, the after elevating dura propria, of course, the, during closing head, the, the elevated dura propria is returned to a cavernous sinus. But the, not not the, not the only just a, just a return. I put a fibrin soaked gel foam in between the cavern sinus and the dura propria. Then dura propria can be uh, adherent to a cavernous lateral wall with a fibrin groove and the gel foam, and uh, it prevent the uh, uh, CSF coming out to the epidural space. And then uh, the the remaining the dura opening stitches. Okay, sir. What do you think about miniaturional approach to treat ICA bifurcation aneurysms? 
Uh, it's a, it, it is good because uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't perform the uh, small craniotomy, but uh, I recommend my young guys uh, to make the uh, standard big craniotomy, uh, including the, uh, the temporal line. Bit, uh, bit over the temporal crane anteriorly, then make the uh, relatively larger craniotomy in my hospital because uh, uh, it is easier for young guys. Uh, but if you are uh, very uh, well experienced to make the, the op operation less invasive, uh, it's, uh, it's a good choice to make the craniotomy smaller if, if the expert neurosurgeon upon the surgeon. But, uh, uh, in my institute, I always let my young neurosurgeons operate. Uh, every day I am uh, observing their surgery. And uh, if something happens or some, if they need something advice, I uh, uh, temporarily scrub in and uh, uh, help them and make the operative field appropriate. And then uh, again, I let them operate. So uh, usually uh, I do not use a, a small craniotomy, uh, uh, keyhole, not, no keyhole approach. Okay, sir. But it, it's elegant. It's elegant to do that approach. Of course. Okay. Um, what is your preferred route for treating basilar tip aneurysm? Do you use the always the transcavernous approach? Is it always necessary to open the sylvian fissure? Ah, good, good question. Uh, you know that uh, both approach, each approach, transribian, subdural transribian approach, epidural or uh, subdural anterotemporal approach or epidural anterotemporal approach, each approach has a, a advantage and a drawback. For example, if we perform the anterior epidural anterior temporal approach, you have to elevate the dura propria from the cavernous sinus. But this has a potential risk of injury of cranial nerves. But uh, uh, subdural anterotemporal approach, transcribian approach, has a potential risk of injury of, of uh, the superficial cerebral veins or middle cerebral veins during a dissection. So, uh, if the subdural anterotemporal approach was uh, uh, good enough to expose the uh, Legion, like a basal top aneurysm or basal aneurysm or carotid aneurysm. I do not perform the epidural approach. But in some cases, the superficial cerebrum veins and the sphenoparietal sinus and the uncal veins uh, disturbs the operative field so much, closing the operative field, such a veins. In such case, the such a crossing vein in the middle of the operative field must be uh, must be mobilized. In such case, the epidural uh, epidural drug proper elevation and uh, detract the uh, the temporal anterior temporal and uh, such a crossing veins uh, could be mobilized posteriorly from epidural space preserving everything. So, uh, depend on the, uh, depend on the course of a superficial cerebrum vein, uncal vein, stenoparietal sinus, uh, which case, uh, it, it, it can be determined, which case is, uh, uh, which case requires uh, epidural approach or uh, only subdural approach. Uh, we should confirm it during surgery. Unfortunately, before surgery, 
it's very difficult to, to distinguish which approach is appropriate. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what are the indications for a posterior clinoidectomy when treating basilar aneurysm? Uh, yeah, it's a good, good question. Today, I couldn't show you a posterior clinoidectomy, uh, but uh, in, in, in general, uh, in a low position basilar CA or low position basilar top aneurysm, uh, they usually require the posterior clinoidectomy because the postcranial process always disturbs to secure the proximal vision. Okay. okay. How, how often do you perform posterior petrosectomy to treat basilar tip aneurysms? Posterior petrosectomy for basilar tip? Never. Uh, posterior petrosectomy uh, is an uh, uh, indication for uh, lower basilar or distal basilar region because, as I told you, in a posterior petrosectomy, we can secure the operative field in a pretty single area. This means that after opening pretty single dura, just, just below the superpetrosal sinus, uh, between superpetrosal sinus and the jugular ball, you can inside the pretty module and open it. The space after opening the pretty module, the space can be secured, can be secured between uh, seven and seven and eight complex and ninth nerve between IAC and the jugular brain. This space is only uh, only uh, this space can uh, uh, enables enables you uh, to approach to a lower vagina and a distal vagina, whatever you need. And if you if you perform the combined anterior and posterior petrosectomy, you can insert the dura anterior to a super petrosal sinus. And uh, along the uh, petrous edge, you can uh, open the dura. And uh, by incising SPS and the tentorium, uh, you, can, uh, pan you can have a, a panoramic view from the uh, trigeminal nerve, uh, seven and eight complex in between, in, in the operative view, middle of the operative view, and the geograph from a nice nerve. So, with the anterior posterior combined petrosal approach, you can have the operative field uh, between the trigeminal nerve and the uh, ninth nerve, between trigeminal foramen and the jugular foramen. Uh, this part is the uh, operative field you can get by uh, combined anterior and posterior petrosecond. So uh, we, we have to we we, ha we have to realize that anterior petrosectomy, even a temp temporal rhomboidectomy, uh, we can get the operative operative field just very small small size of small space between trigeminal and uh, seventh nerve. In a posterior petrosectomy, very small operative field between the uh, seventh complex and uh, ninth nerve. You see? Okay, sir. What is your preferred approach to treat a Bernasconi casinari arterial aneurysm? Uh, nowadays, uh, if it, it is a uh, unruptured and a small one, uh, basically, uh, it, it's, an, it's a, not a uh, uh, no indication of a surgery. But if it is ruptured and uh, it's a, it causes a suborgan hemorrhage, uh, it can be operated. But uh, uh, nowadays, the first choice should be endovascular. 
uh, in the Pascal coil. So the, if uh, you try to do a direct clipping, uh, we have to do a uh, we have to do a cavernous approach uh, by elevating dura propria and uh, exposing the the, the car carotid posterior uh, posterior C four C five segment by uh, uh, by opening the uh, uh, Parkinson triangle or or, or Supermedia uh, triangle or something. Hmm. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary. Uh, Transcavernous approach is necessary. Hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. If I see a raptors during an, an anterior petrosectomy, what is the best treatment option? I see a rupture. You mean the, the during of a C6 carotid? Uh, internal carotid artery, yeah. During uh, anterior petrosectomy. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the question. It's, yeah. a, it's a it's a catastrophe. <laughs> don't drill it. Uh, don't drill it. But if uh, you injure the carotid, uh, just uh, put a uh, uh, surgical cotton ball with a fibrin soaked size cotton ball appropriate size to cover the breathing point of a carotid and uh, put it on the breathing breathing point if can you see it if this is a cotton ball and the breathing point here the cotton ball must be bigger than the breathing breathing hole and the cotton ball should be placed like this and uh, Com compress, not to compress the carotid completely. Compress and uh, the, uh, the other hair and uh, other hair, the, the cotton ball on the breathing hole with uh, the cotton or something. Then wait five minutes, 10 minutes, wait until you have a complete hemostasis. Then Simultaneously, ask your colleagues to take a saphenous, and uh, you have to reconstruct the uh, uh, carotid with uh, external carotid to middle cerebral artery with a bypass. I think uh, if I if I have a such a situation, I do that. Thank you, sir. So, um, on behalf of CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Tanikawa. These have been two wonderful lectures. We're really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2020 IWBNC. So far, we have more than 3,400 registrants from more than 120 countries, and it keeps rising. Thank you. Thanks to all the audience for joining us during the second day of the IWBNC. We hope you will be able to connect to our broadcast tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. EDT. Do not forget to check the full agenda on our website, cnheus.com. Also, follow us in our official accounts on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you, Dr. Tanikawa, and thank you all. Thank you. Welcome. See you. Bye-bye. See you.